Hey, it's nice to meet you. We're obviously big fans of your work. Um, so I'm so grateful you agreed to, uh, to come talk to us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's always fun to talk about um, the Denzon Dynasty. And uh, I'm just so excited to talk to you and uh, your viewers. Yeah, um, I was just going to introduce, I mean, you probably hear you know who Ken Liu is, but uh, he is the author of The Dandelion Dynasty, which starts with The Grace of King and some short story collections, The Paper Menagerie and Other Stories which was one of my top five books of this year, just for everybody. So you guys should definitely read that. And then Hidden Girls Amazing. and Other Stories, which Kyle and I both only own on Kindle. So <laughs> uh, I love it. Yep. there's the Kindle version. Um, and then with me is also Kyle from the Instagram, read by Kyle. And we buddy read uh, Wall of Storms and um, The Veiled Throne just last month, which is book two and three in the Dandelion Dynasty. So kind of introduction for everybody. We know you just got back from Hawaii, Ken. How was it? Uh, it was amazing. We got to see some turtles, got to see some friends, uh, got to have a lot of sun while it's snowing back here in Boston. So can't okay. complain. It's minus 35 where I am right now. So <laughs> I want to hear about Hawaii. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's awesome. Minus 35 Celsius. <laughs> Celsius, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm in Canada, so it's really cold. Cars don't Either way, it's pretty cold, so. Yeah. <laughs> cold either way. Um, uh, Kyle, did so, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. So um, one thing before we get too far into Dandelion Dynasty, I don't want to neglect the short stories because I just think you are a phenomenal short story writer. Um, I appreciate it. Thank the, you. The Paper Menagerie, I mean... I was sitting next to my wife and I was reading it and she just looked over and I was like trying not to cry. And she's like, what are you, what are you reading? And I'm like, it's just really I'm good. Sorry. So, so like, I think you're really good at uh, writing the short stories, but um, like, I guess one thing that I wanted to ask is how do you approach like writing short stories versus writing like kind of something ep epic and longer? Uh, yeah. Like the Dandelion yeah. Dynasty. Yeah. It's, it's a great question. Um, you know, the way I think about it, I, I've said this before, um, I think when I started out as a writer, um, there was this impression that I don't think it's all that uncommon that sure stories are very closely related to novels, meaning a novel is just a very long story and the short story is just a very short novel. Um, it, it turns out that's not true at all, not even remotely. <laughs> the two are completely different animals. Uh, it's more like a short story is like a mosquito and uh, a novel is like an elephant. Uh, it's not just that the two are very different in size, it's that they have very different body plans. You, you can't actually scale a mosquito up to the size of an elephant and expect to have a viable creature. And you can't shrink an elephant down to the size of a mosquito and, and expect that it's gonna survive. It just doesn't work that way. Um, you know, biologically it, it doesn't work uh, for many reasons, but you know, one of them is that um, insects rely on passive um, air exchange to breathe. Um, and, and that kind of body plan just can't scale up to the size of an elephant. The surface area and the volume of the body relationship is such that that the, the, the animal would just suffocate, literally. Um, and the analogy works because there are things that novels require for it to retain that energy, that narrative drive that often just isn't necessary in a short story. And there are things you can do in a short story that when you try to carry it out at the scale of a novel will just feel completely not interesting and, and unsustainable. Um, so for example, I have a short story called uh, The Book Making Habits of Select Species, which is actually the first story in mm -hmm. the Paper Menagerie. And therefore uh, viewers who are interested can just go look at the preview on Amazon and get a sense of it. Um, that's a story in which there are no characters. Uh, there is no plot. Um, it's written as, as an ethnographic paper. That kind of approach works in a short story, but I, I really don't believe that can work in a novel. Uh, mm -hmm. A novel mm -hmm. written like that with no characters, no plot, essentially none, nothing that works as a narrative isn't really gonna work. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you can get away with in, in a short story. That's the kind of experimental thing you can do in a short story. I had to learn essentially how to plot when I uh, 
turn from short stories to novels, especially a novel like the Dendulin Dynasty, where, you know, the same narrative has to be sustained over 1 million plus words uh, instead of 3,000 words. Uh, it's just a very different kind of animal. Um, I told a lot of friends when I was working on the Dendron Dynasty that it felt like I was one of those workers working on the pyramids or the Sphinx. Um, I, I know that I'm working on something, but when I'm polishing that square foot right under my nose, I have no idea what the whole thing looks like. I just don't, I can't, I cannot get the thing in my head. Um, the way I can with a short story. Um, but just to finish up this little uh, digression, I ended up realizing there's actually a real interesting, a really interesting connection between short stories and novels, at least as I uh, worked in both. Um, it turns out that the book Making Habits of Select Species, which is about writing, about language, about means of preserving stories, uh, means by which we make language literally part of our bodies. Um, it turns out that these are the same concerns that animate and drive uh, the Dendron dynasty, especially in the later books. So mm -hmm. I like to say that in some ways, the book Making Habits of Select Species is the um, mosquito version of the elephant that is the Dendron dynasty and vice versa. So even though I said it, it can't be done, I sort of did it. <laughs> that's that's basically it. The one million plus word giant epic fantasy, the soul of that novel, that, that series actually is in the book Making Habits of Select Species. So that's kind of sort of a full circle moment for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like you just injected character or viewpoint into that short story because- If you will. Yes, I would even, <laughs> maybe a little bit. I would even expand it outwards because one thing I was going to bring up a little bit is that um, a lot of the stories, especially in uh, Paper Menagerie, but also in The Hidden Girl, are things that you are still exploring uh, very closely in the Dandelion Dynasty. Um, it's almost like if you were to take mm -hmm. the short story collections and then be, and make a list of the things that are important to you, and then you could just almost guess what you were going to be exploring in the Dandelion Dynasty because like things like collective memory and how what we choose to remember makes us who we are and, and the stories that we tell ourselves and stuff. And, uh, you know, like I can definitely see those blueprints. Absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're hundred percent right there. Uh, a lot of the, um, the ideas and themes I was exploring in those stories ended up in the novel in one form or another. Um, I, I like to say a novel, even though it's a series, because in my mind, the whole thing was written as one, massive narrative. Um, and sometimes that leads to interesting decisions when you have to divide them up into books, uh, which we can talk about <laughs> later on. Well, I actually did have a question about that, which is that it feels like the grace of kings is very specifically one generation. And then with Wall of Storms and Veiled Throne, and I'm assuming what we're going to see in Speaking Bones um, is kind of like a separate generation. So where was that decision to kind of make it one v3 which i know originally was two but where did so, that come you from know, yeah i can i can try to tell you a story that makes me sound smart but <laughs> I, I can't because you know in real life a lot of these decisions are not planned they're just sort of fortuitous and and sometimes you try to make the best of it and you try to work with uh circumstances and sometimes it just doesn't work um so i'll tell you what happened here um I had this plan initially for writing a massive epic fantasy series. Um, and I just, I couldn't get started because I wanted to explore all these ideas, but I didn't know how. Uh, and my wife, Lisa, um, at the time, um, and she was like, you know, if it's hard for you to do it, maybe maybe we can do it together and that will give you some drive because if there's somebody else doing it with you, it doesn't feel as daunting. So I was like, oh, that sounds like a good idea. So we were trying to create a world um, that made sense and, and a world big enough and grand enough to tell a, a huge multi-generational story. This was like 11 years ago or something. Um, and Lisa and I both have this, um, have very fond memories of these martial arts epics, um, uh, old wuxia films and TV shows made in Hong Kong. Um, and uh, they're based on Jin Yong's uh, novels. And so we were like, maybe there's a way to take some of that aesthetic and try to 
rewrite it and reimagine it uh, and and turn it into something more uh, akin to uh, traditional fantasy, uh, the kind of things that we also like. Um, so we started trying to build the world of Dara together um, and trying to figure out what kind of story we wanted to tell. And we settled on the idea of trying to reimagine a version of the Chu Han contentions, sort of the founding of the Han dynasty, uh, which is a very important part of Chinese history. So just as you know, Game of Thrones was inspired by the War of the Roses, um, we thought we would take the Chu Han contention and turn it into some sort of uh, epic, which I inspired kind of story. Um, long story short, that was the original plan. Uh, Lisa got super busy and she just ended up not being able to do it during, uh, we actually tried to do this during NaNoWriMo. Uh, she ended up just not being able to do it. Um, but I was like, well, I think the idea is interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll take the idea and carry it through and see what I can do with it. Um, at that point, I took the idea and then I decided to go in a different direction. Um, I said, okay, I sort of like the idea of that, um, that very grand, multi-generation, um, epic story where it's, it's hundreds of characters, lots of plot lines. I really like that because I've never done anything like that. I, I like to try it, but I don't want it to be um, limited to an East Asian aesthetic. Uh, I kind of wanted to make it somehow grander and, and more interesting to me. Um, and then I realized that I, I didn't, I wanted to do something really interesting that hasn't been done before, as far as I, uh, I knew at the time, which is um, I wanted to tell an epic fantasy story, but it's a story really about modernity and about nations, about republics, about democracies, about the founding of constitutions, because uh, I'm a lawyer, so constitutions and, and, and institutions are very important to me. I, as far as I know, I don't know of an epic fantasy that explicitly sets out with its goal to tell a story about constitutions. And that's what I wanted to do. And I said, okay, how do I want to do this? How do I, I want to do something really interesting, really strange, really, that really hasn't been done before. And then it struck me when we talk about constitutions and about republics and about democracies, our tendency, um, at least in the modern age, is to focus on the story as an exclusively Western story. Our references when we talk about the American story, which is the story I'm most interested in, is to use the model of Rome um, or um, Greece to, to tell the story. So for example, uh, all of us can imagine that if you write an epic about say the Peloponnesian War during the time of Thucydides, it's a natural mapping to the struggle between the United States as a representative of democracy and the Soviet Union as a representative of um, more autocratic tendencies. You can also imagine that a lot of story about the Roman Republic very naturally map to stories about America because America has a tendency to view itself as a new incarnation of Rome in the way it relates to the world, in the way it sees itself, in the way it views its own strength and weaknesses. So I said, okay, this is all very interesting, but what if I challenge that? What if I tried to tell the story of America not using a Greco-Roman model, but use an East Asian model? What if I could take the Chuhan contention, which is also a story about the emergence of a new people from a diverse collection of people. It's about the founding of a new nation, a new identity. What if I took that story and mapped it to the story of America? What if I could tell the story of a modernity using not Greco-Roman references, but East Asian references. That, as far as I know, has never been done because when fantasy novelists write about East Asia, they try to tell the story of China, whatever that means. Uh, but I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in taking these old myths and trying to use it to retell the story and reimagine the story and reconceive and reconstitute the story of modernity, of America. Uh, so that was my bold vision, if you will. Uh, and, you know, I was like, oh, my God, how do I execute it? Um, and then I came up with a plan, which is the first book, The Grace of Kings, is going to be basically a primer on a set of mythological concepts. Um, most of us here in the West are very familiar with the story of Athens versus Sparta, the, the story of how did Rome come to be Rome? You know, the, 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 the Punic Wars, the... 
um, the story of uh, Julius Caesar crossing the Rubicon, you know, all of these things have become part of our vocabulary, even in the US, even the way we talk about our political system, our vocabulary is derived from Roman times. So these stories are very familiar. So if you're trying to tell a, a story about America using um, Roman models, you don't have to explain anything. People would just understand it. But very few people here in the West are familiar with the story of Liu Bang and Xiang Yu and, and the entire backstory of um, the Chuhan contention, which is what I'm trying to do here. So I said, okay, I'm going to take the grace of kings, essentially, and make it into a, a, a reimagining of that whole history of the Chuhan contention. Once I've done that, I've got the political vocabulary, the historical vocabulary, the, the set of illusions and myths and legends in place. Once I get that in place, now I can take all of these pieces and tell a totally new story in the rest of the series, which is all about how do you reconceive the story of modernity using these East Asian references and, and historical uh, models. And so while I was writing The Grace of Kings, I was very conscious about planting these seeds. I wanted to make parallel comparisons between these East Asian story models and um, Greco-Roman epics, the Aeneid, um, the Odyssey, the Iliad. I wanted to make comparisons between them and also the great Anglo-Saxon epics that I loved um, when I was in college, Beowulf, the Battle of Malden. I wanted to make comparisons between these stories and Paradise Lost, which is the great Christian epic. I wanted to, to get readers a sense that all of these epic narratives are connected because all of them are about the founding of new peoples, the founding of new nations. Uh, that's what epics do. Epics are really constitutions for a people. They are mythological stories about how a people came to be and who they are. Um, here in the U.S., we have our own grand epic, uh, and and you know we we don't worship gods, but we worship the founding fathers and the Constitution. These figures play larger than life roles. They are they are the gods and generals of our imagination, and I wanted to reconceptualize that, reconceive all of that um, using these models from East Asia, which will allow us to see the story of America in a whole new light. So, long story short, that was. The whole Grace of Kings. And so Grace of Kings can be in some ways understood as a prequel to the series proper. And the series proper starts with the Wall of Storms. It goes on to Speaking Bones. Um, I wrote, I conceived of the whole thing as one grand narrative. And with the Wall of Storms, it's pretty natural to stop it where it did because, you know, a, a great war just came to an end. Uh, so I was like, okay, this is a good place to take a breather before we go on to the next part, which is how do you confront the challenges of legitimacy? How do you deal with the idea of who gets to be considered a member of the people of Dara? Who, what does it mean to have settler co colonialism as part of your uh, legacy? What does it mean to have enslavement? What does it mean to have all of these things as part of the very foundation of your society on the verge of stepping into modernity? Um, and so that's basically what The Veiled Throne and Speaking Bones is about. I, I wrote that entire 600,000, 700,000 narrative as one big book. Uh, and then when I turned that into my publisher, it took me years to write. I, I turned that to my publisher um, and, you know, it took my editor actually a whole year before he got back to me um, because it was just that long. Uh, and when he got back to me, he was basically, he was basically like, uh, look, we, we, we can't publish this as one book. There's just actually no way to do it. Um, I mean, you know, if you look at the book, this is how, this is Speaking Bones, and this is how thick it is. So imagine twice as thick. Um, his point was like, we literally can't bind a book like that without it falling <laughs> apart. It's just, we can't do that. So, you know, you, you're going to have to decide what you want to do. Um, and it's, it's, is Speaking Bones longer than Veiled Throne? Uh, it's actually about about the same, maybe 10 okay. pages longer, but it's about the same. Um, so, uh, you know, people sometimes think that we write these books long because we want to. No, I don't want to. <laughs> if I could have written this thing as a shorter book, I would have. Uh, the only reason it's long is because 
that's how long the story is. Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I had a hard decision to make, you know, what do I do? Uh, I ended up just chopping the book right down the middle. That to me mm -hmm. turned out to be the easiest thing to do because my thinking is this, um, once the books are out 10, 15 years down the road, readers who come to the series will understand that these two books are really part parts of one book. They will understand that. So I don't want to optimize just for the moment, for the moment when I'm publishing, you know, for me to artificially put a climax on the end of the first part and to figure out some way to connect to the next part. It just, it didn't make sense to me. I wanted to plan for the long term, which is these books will be out um, together when readers approach it in the future. So I'm going to optimize for that case. So I just chop the manuscript right down the middle, literally. Uh, and that's why the Veiled Throne ends on a cliffhanger of the cliffhanger of cliffhangers, uh, because because the literally was in the middle of one. Um, so so I, I think the Veiled Throne, Speaking Bones, will read strangely to readers if they don't know the backstory, because it will seem as if the Veiled Throne has no climax. It, it, it builds up to this moment and then it just sort of stops. Um, but I'm hoping that once the books are all out, it will make sense. So that's mm -hmm. how that happened. So yeah, what I'm that, hearing um, is, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that. That's fine that you say that because I've always viewed The Grace of Kings as a prequel. And so I'm glad to know that. Yeah, and I, didn't, and I didn't think of it as, <laughs> um, well, I like the, uh, the term of it setting up our vernacular that we need to understand the actual story, which I, I didn't think about. So that was cool. Anyway, Kyle. I was just going to make a dumb joke of just like, it doesn't sound like you've thought about this at all. <laughs> You know, you just, you just, you just pants it the whole way through. See, that's kind of true. I mean, it, it happened. And I was like, oh, there's another book that has to be, uh, what do I do? Where do I divide this? Where now? Um, I'm a huge nerd. So before we get too past it, I just like have to say that I really love the Chu Han contention. And so I'm one of the small amount of fans in the West that like, as I was reading, we'll I was like, it. is, is this Zhang Yu? Like, this yeah. feels like, so like, I just love that whole thing. Um, and I, I really liked it. Like, obviously you're telling your own story, but people are going to understand that you're drawing from this era and then go back yep. and find it and then yep. discover how great it is. Yeah. Which is, I mean, a very common thing in fantasy as well. We're just used to seeing mm -hmm. it, like you said, with the European on the West um, retelling those. I mean, how many retelling of Greek myths are there? You know what I mean? So right. I was the uncultured one. I, I hadn't, I didn't know. So it read all new to me, Kyle and But Lane it should <laughs> work without you knowing. I mean, and that's it did. point. Right. Yeah. If you didn't know, in some ways, that's even more interesting because now you're acquiring this entirely new fantasy set of references that do have very deep history, but you don't need to know that for it to work, um, which right. is kind of the what I wanted to do. Well, it worked for both of us, so it worked <laughs> in the end. Awesome. Yeah, like um, one of the things about the Dandelion Dynasty is just that like it it is so intelligently constructed. Um, you can tell like there's just so much labor of love there where there's all of these little backdrops and you're like, well, how does this, how is this going to come together? You know, how is cow stomachs going to be relevant to the right. plot? And then, <laughs> and then it all comes together and you're like, wow. And so I guess my question in relation to that is how do you decide um when you're going to reveal what parts of the, the narrative to the readers because you don't you mostly tell linearly but you kind of sometimes you just backdrop and you're like two yeah. weeks ago like particularly Again, in wall of storms you you backdrop mm -hmm. us in that huge climax at the end um to give us context um, again, if if uh, I could claim to be much smarter than I actually am, so I I, I, I won't do that though. I'll, I'll tell you honestly how how it happened. Um, I am one of those writers. Um, I I can't plan everything out ahead of time. I just it, I I can't work that way. Um, for me, the the joy is in the doing of it and in the discovery of it. I, if I outline everything and plan everything out, I just lose all drive to even write it. It's not interesting to me anymore. I have to actually explore and write and discover as I'm going along. So um, this means that uh, I've learned a long time ago to compensate for this by doing the following, which is I don't outline. I just, I don't. I, I know that a lot of writers swear by outlines and it doesn't work for me at all. The way I go about it is I have in my head 
some set pieces and some giant plot turns that I know ahead of time. So for example, before I wrote The Wall of Storms, I knew how Speaking Bones will end. I, I know the last scene of the entire epic. I, I know the last scene. I know how it's going to go. Um, I also know there's going to be a giant Gorinathan uh, airship battle. I also know there's going to be another scene like that. And I, I know there's going to be a, a, a very important declaration of love scene. I know that there will be these things. They're sort of islands in the sea. But I don't want to fill everything out in between. I want to navigate my own course and explore a path going from one to the next as I'm drafting. So when I'm drafting, I don't have an outline. I just, I just go. I just, I just tell myself, look, in about uh, this is where I need to get to. Now I have my characters here. Let them figure out how to get to that point, to point A. Uh, and once they got there. I have to figure out how to get to point B. And, you know, as I'm drafting this and figuring things out, the characters surprise me. Uh, sometimes halfway through, uh, one of my characters says, you know, this is a stupid plan. This doesn't make any sense. I, I don't want to do it this way. I, I this, is, this is the plan I would have gone with, you idiot author. Um, so I'm like, okay, that sounds like a good plan. I'll go with yours. Um, so I just go with it. I don't care about the fact that it because it's it, I'm, I'm doing this sudden swerve in the middle of everything. It doesn't make sense. I, I just go. I just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, the character says this is what we're going to do, so we're going to go with it. So I draft the whole thing that way. And then I know this is a mess. I know this makes no sense. Now I go back and do the real work of a second pass where I go through and I'm like, okay, in order for that to happen, this has to be planted now. So I'm going to go back and fix this. Um, I can't have you die here, so sorry, can't die, you know, resurrect, let's go on, you know, things like that. I have to go to the second pass, which is basically about making old Ken look smart by fixing all these things that old Ken did not know. Um, so after the second pass, the thing actually looks kind of like a novel now. It has the shape, but it's still a mess. So I have to do a third pass where I'm like, okay, now let's try to make Ken seem like not just an idiot and, and not just of average, you know, uh, intelligence, but actually let's make him a little bit smarter than, than, than he could be, than I actually am. Because, you know, when you're able to go over the same thing multiple times, you can certainly make yourself seem much smarter than you are. <laughs> so I just go back and do that. Um, and then sometimes I have to go over the same thing several times. So uh, if, uh, if my notes are correct, I went over the drafting of the book that eventually became Speaking Bones and The Veil Throne, a grand total of five major passes, five drafting passes. And this is not counting all the revision passes and all the fixed things up passes and all the copy editing passes and all the proofreading passes and so on and so forth. It took five major passes. And with each pass, the book grew. I think it started out at about 400,000, then it became 500, 600, 700,000, and then it shrank a little bit and then it grew again. Uh, so that's what happened. Um, so in terms of how do I decide when to put things in, this is how. I, I just, I go over things repeatedly and see what makes sense to be put in there when. Um, and then I, because I'm going over this many times, I had the benefit of being able to, um, see the whole thing now, if you will, um, from a God's eye point of view. And I can actually make all of these pieces fit. And, you know, it's a huge amount of work, but, but it does, it does work. I was going to say that surprises me because it's so detail oriented. I assumed you had like some master plot before you even started writing like every little detail. So that's you have a sticky note with cow stomachs <laughs> yeah. on, the, on the wall. The master plot wondering... came afterwards. It's, it's more like reverse outlining. It's more like yeah. after I've done writing my outline. And so I have a wiki, a wiki of the whole thing, but it's generated afterwards, not beforehand. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. I want to know who, who are the characters that give you the most trouble? Who are the characters that argue with you the most as you're writing them who say, no, I don't want to do what you're telling me to do? Uh, that would be Gia. Uh, I knew sure. it. I was just yeah. going to say that it was Gia. Uh, I really, we gonna really was going to guess that. Much or, smarter, um... She's much smarter than I am. So the plot I had for her uh, made no sense. And, and, and so halfway through, she said, no, 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 that is not what I want to do. And that is not what I did. 
Um, so I went back and fixed it. Uh, but no, she's the one who, who gave me the most trouble. And and it's it's not a, not until I fixed her and and gave her what she deserved, the 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 plot and the strategy that she deserved, that the whole thing actually came together. I would say half of our discussion through Wall of Storms and Veiled Throne was just one of us messaging the other being like, do you know what G is up to right now? Yeah. <laughs> because yeah. in the first book, she was, I don't know about Hillary, but she was one of my absolute, like maybe no, even my favorite too. character. And then some Things things change. Yeah, some things well, change. She, I, I, I'm not spoiling anything by telling you that she remains uh, my favorite character or one of my mm -hmm. favorite characters. Um, and I, I believe she is going to be one of those characters who will be very controversial in terms of how people see her, um, as all great uh, leaders tend to be. Um, they, they, they make decisions that will, will have huge consequences. Um, and uh, whether you agree her or not, um, her impact, she's one of those leaders who will end up being called something the great. Uh, and if you think of all the leaders who are something the great, they all have that quality. Uh, they're mm -hmm. going to have people who will love them and people who absolutely despise them. They will be heroes and villains, depending on whose narrative uh, you're reading. Yeah, and I think that's a theme of, I mean, for me, of Dandelion Dynasty in general is no character in that is it easy to be like, they're just all good. Like we can just be like every decision they make, like it's so easy to root for. Like it's really hard. All the characters make very complicated decisions like i mean real people do and real leaders you know it's absolutely amazing. i mean i think that's a that's a theme that i've always um that's always been very powerful for me the idea that we don't really know we don't have complete knowledge and we can't know the consequences of our actions but we can't we cannot judge people's actions based solely on their intentions, but we also can't judge them solely on the result either. Um, in, in the great moments, we just do the best we can. We decide and then we live with the consequences. Um, people are not angels. We're, 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 we're not angels, not just because we're not perfect, but because we are not all knowing. We, we, we just do the best we can given the veil of ignorance that we're, we're forced to pass through. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's the human condition. Um, we we have to be at peace with that. Um, and whether you're a hero or a villain sometimes depends largely on the matter of um, interpretation. Okay, I have a, I have a question to jump off of this. This is a loaded term, uh, and everybody kind of brings their own uh, criteria to it. But when I finished Wall of Storms, I messaged Hillary, and I was like, I think this might be a grimdark book. And she was like, I came to the same thing too. And when a lot of people think of Grimdark, they think of stuff that uh, your books don't really have. But I think a lot of the actual essence of Grimdark is in Wall of Storms. Would you agree with that? Or do you think that that label is too far? You know, I, I don't. Um, here's what I think. Um, I myself don't work with labels meaning when i write a book i don't explicitly set out to write a book that falls into one label or another um i mean this is why when i wrote uh the series um you know my editor and and my publicist were like what sort of book is this how do you want to describe it and i said i don't know because i i, I didn't set out to write it under one subgenre or another which is why I actually invented my own term silk punk to describe it, which I can get into later about what I mean by that. Um, but, you know, I don't have a problem with readers classifying the way they like to. Um, I think labels and especially genre labels are very helpful because they set up an inter interpretive framework and they allow readers to make sense of the story by comparing it to other stories that are that fall into the same genre. And there's a conversation that happens between the books that can be very helpful to readers. Um, I mean, I do the same thing. Um, I, I don't like labels and I don't work from labels, but I did just describe to all, both of you right now, I, I described my series as an epic and I explicitly made a comparison to grand epics. Um, like the Zhuhan Contention by Sima Qian, you know, the, the, histor the historical account, um, like Ilya, like the Odyssey, like the Aeneid, um, like Beowulf. Um, I am obviously, by doing that, setting up the book 
to be in conversation with all of them. So obviously, I, I do draw on those labels myself. Um, calling uh, The Well of Storms a grimdark book is very interesting to me. It's not what I set out to do. It's not what I intended. But I do find that very evocative by saying that it is. it, it draws on some of the same things that grimdark books draw on. I, I think that's interesting. I will say, though, that um, I am myself a very optimistic person, um, and I always believe that um, human nature is actually fundamentally good and that even the greatest villains are, in fact, heroes in their own narratives. And a lot of our grand tragedy comes from the fact that we cannot all agree on the same understanding of the world. And so our heroism often works at cross purposes. Um, and so many things in, in, in the world are awful and, and, and terrible um, as it is in the real world. But fundamentally, I hold on to two messages throughout the Dungeon Dynasty that I think are very important to me. One is uh, something that Luan Zia, or now Ziaji, um, uh, says over and over again, the universe is knowable. Uh, I do mm. believe that. I think that's very important, uh, which actually in some ways might make um, a Dungeon Dynasty not so much fantasy as sci-fi, because the universe is knowable, is fundamentally a, a science fictional um, uh, uh, doctrine. Um, and the other is um, do the most interesting thing. Um, you know, this is something that Cooney told uh, his children, and, and this is something that his children have made their own. Um, and, and this is something that the people of Dara and, and others have also made something that, that, that they deeply believe in. Humans can always do interesting things and, and doing the most interesting thing rather than the easiest thing or the most expected thing is often the only thing that will bring hope. Uh, and I do fundamentally believe that doing the interesting thing will bring us to a hopeful state. Um, so again, without spoiling anything, um, the the two books, The Veiled Throne and Speaking Bones, are my attempts to work that out. You, you've hit on a lot of stuff Kyle and I have talked about like a lot in terms of the book. Um, I think the Wall of Storms thing is just because it was so dark in a lot of places. Like I, I really struggled. There, there were times where I messaged Kyle, I was like, I have to take a break because this is just so, so upsetting what I'm reading that's happening to our characters. But um, I think what's interesting you said about, um, you know, the world being knowable and it's sci-fi and the no labels, it kind of reminds me of the paper menagerie, the, the book, because I was really, um, I loved how it was kind of like magical realism, but then there was sci-fi and then there was fantasy. So I think is that kind of no label idea? Did that influence you to just kind of, you know, explore them all? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think I've said this in other contexts too. Um, I, I never set out to be a sci-fi writer or a fantasy writer. Um, it, it, it wasn't something I explicitly set out to do. I know there are writers who are actually very conscious about genres and who started out right away by saying, this is what I want to do. I want to write in this genre. This is the genre that makes me excited. This is what's interesting to me. Um, I That was not my experience. Uh, I, I was not attached to genre labels in a very deep way. Um, what really mattered to me is the whole idea of making metaphors literal. I call it the literalization of metaphors. Um, this has to do with the way I read as well. I often read fantasy and sci-fi books, not so much as books about science or about magic, but as books about fundamentally how can a metaphor be made literally true? And what does that mean? Um, so, you know, to give you an example, um, you know, one very common metaphor in modern uh, in modernity is this idea of alienation, the idea that we're so disconnected from our fellow human beings that we're no longer sure if they are real or not. Um, that, that they're literally aliens, or we're aliens, or we're we're un, unable to to communicate with each other and to even share the same world effectively. So this is normally dealt with in literary fiction in a metaphorical sense, this this deep sense of alienation. We're not talking about real aliens here; we're real robots. But 
if you try to approach it in a, a sci-fi context, you often would turn that metaphor literally true. So you might have a world in which um, the alienation is so deep that you you no longer can even trust that your fellow human beings are human beings. Maybe they're actually robots who just happen to look like humans. And in which case you have to find out some sort of test to figure out how do you tell a real human being apart from a robot? What is the thing that makes humans human? Maybe it's it's empathy. Maybe it's the ability to cry when you see a turtle die. Um, so if you follow that metaphor, that literalized metaphor to its end, you end up with something like, do androids dream of electric sheep or Blade Runner? Um, so I never read Blade Runner as some sort of book about science fiction in the sense of this is about technology, about the invention of robots. I, I never understood it that way. I understood it in the same way I understood Paradise Lost as essentially a, a story about a metaphor made literally true. So that influenced the way I approach fantasy and sci-fi writing myself. I don't consciously set out to say I'm going to write a genre story using these genre tropes. I use these genre tropes because they make sense as a way to make a metaphorical thing literally true. So the paper menagerie is like that. Um, we speak metaphorically about love making the world come alive, making everything have meaning. So what if that's literally true? What if these paper animals actually came to life? Um, um, you know, it's, it's magic realism, it's fantasy, it's sci-fi, what have you. Um, I don't particularly get attached to the labels. I, I enjoy the idea of making a metaphorical thing literally true. Um, so that's kind of how I come about it. You let the themes drive you, which yeah. makes sense because your work has so many themes. Um, one I wanted to talk about I don't, is parenthood as a theme, yeah. um, specifically in the paper menagerie, the actual story, <laughs> um, which I cried a lot at. And then I'm a parent, so <laughs> that was really tough to read. And then um, specifically with Sarah and um, Timu in... Uh, the Veiled Throne, um, I was particularly <laughs> moved by Sarah wanting her children to like or value what she valued and having right. that issue. And I was just wondering if you could speak on that theme, um, just because it affected me a lot. Yeah, I, you know, uh, this is one of those things that, um, uh, that I observe in myself, you know, uh, my, the Dental and Dynasty as a series is, the same age as my oldest daughter. I, I literally started writing it when my oldest daughter was uh, just uh, three months old or something like that. Uh, no, actually, she was, uh, I believe, uh, seven months old at the time. Uh, seven, yeah. So um, ideas about what it means to be a parent, what it means to try to be responsible for some another life to 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 um it, it's it, it became so important to me and and a lot of my work um in the last 10 years has revolved around this whole concept of what does it mean to be a parent what does it mean to um to raise a child what does it mean to um be a father um and i ended up thinking a lot about my own childhood and what it means to to grow up and to acquire this idea of, of how to be a how to be a person, um, and it, it came to me that you know uh, I like to say that we're actually made of stories all the way down. What I mean is this, um, you know, I'm going to ask you and also viewers uh, to think about a word that's important to them, whether it's love or faith or patriotism um, or honor something, some word that's very important to them and think deeply about what that word means to them. If you spend 30 seconds just closing your eyes and meditating on it, um, I guarantee you that what you're, what you're gonna end up with is not some dictionary definition, it's not some abstract philosophical definition, but rather a very concrete story about how that value is encoded for you. So for example, for me, you know, when I think about love, I don't really think about C.S. Lewis and the four loves, and I don't think about the Greek roots, and I don't really think about the Latin root. I don't think about the classical Chinese distinctions. I don't think about all of that, even though I work with all of these things all my life. Fundamentally, what comes to me is a memory, which is my grandmother uh, when I was a small child. Maybe I was in the third grade or something, and I was sitting there uh, doing my homework, and my grandmother was just sitting next to me, keeping me company. Um, 
and knitting a sweater. It was winter, so it was very cold. Uh, and I could see that my grandmother, who had terrible arthritis, so her joints were very swollen. And I could see that when she was manipulating these needles, it really hurt. She and, and her her fingers were chapped. And so, you know, I could see it was very painful for her. And so I said, you know, Grandma, does that hurt when you when you when you're knitting the sweater? And she says, Yeah, it does. And so I say, you know, why 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 do you do this? Why are you knitting a sweater? Why don't you stop? And she says, Well, I don't want you to be cold. Um, you know, she she made the sweater for me because that's how um, she kept me warm. And to me, that is the memory that defines what love means. And I think that's true for all of us. We all have a memory that allows us to understand what courage is. Maybe it's a classmate who stood up for us on the playground um, when she didn't have to. Maybe it's a moment. Maybe honesty is a moment when a parent uh, confessed to something that, that he didn't have to. But fundamentally, we are not defined. Our deepest commitments and values are not defined by abstractions, by philosophies, but by these very concrete stories that embody for us in a very concrete way what it actually means. And to me, um, this is no different from how myth and, 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 and fairy tales and, and mythologies and religions work, because these are fundamentally mythological stories that give us our give our lives meaning. Um, you know, I think that all of us are like the heroes of epic fantasies. We're like Adam in Paradise Lost or uh, Ankidu uh, at the beginning of, of Gilgamesh. We're born into the world naked, knowing nothing. And into that void, our parents are like gods. They come to us and they give us our first stories. The way they act to us, the way they love us, defines for us what love means. And the way they hurt us also defines for us what pain means. The way they are courageous is how we understand the word. The way they're honest is the way we will claim to honor. Um, these, and then later on, other gods and heroes come to our lives like guides in the dark wood of um of life uh as we go through the, the, the through the middle course uh teachers friends mentors they all come to us and their stories become part of our personal mythology and this is how we become who we are we are made of layers of stories and later on as we become mentors friends teachers and parents ultimately we in turn pass on these stories to our children by acting out the values that we cherish the most. Uh, the way we love them is the way they will understand love. The way we are courageous is the way they will understand how to be brave. Um, and so this is this is it. This is all of human culture. This is this is the only thing that matters. We dress it up as you know being about ideology and philosophy and all this nonsense, but it's really not. Fundamentally it's just the story you live, the myth you embody for your children, and which they will then in turn embody for, for their children and those who come after them. Generation after generation, this is the only thing that matters. This is how we constitute an individual, a family, a tribe, a nation. These are constitutive acts. The way we behave toward each other, the way we explain to each other who we are and act out who we are who we are to each other is the only form of the constitution that really matters. This is what the constitution actually means. It's the constitutive acts collectively with each generation recommitting to these stories, reenacting these stories, reliving these stories, redefining these stories, retelling these stories, reimagining these stories. This is the only way that a constitution can have meaning. Um, and this is a theme that, you know, ended up being pervasive in my work um, in the Dungeon Dynasty and in the short stories. This idea of, as we mentioned earlier, collective memory, collective action, collective definition, um, the way we pass on values, not by talking, but by acting and living and, 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 and embodying the very things that we care about the most for those who come after us. I feel like I just attended a TED talk. I need to go call yes. my parents. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, <laughs> I, I actually have the stories we tell ourselves tattooed on my wrist. Oh my um, God. And so when I was reading the books, I was like, oh, this is definitely like we see eye to eye on this kind of thing. The stories are exactly that. They're just yeah. how we see the world, right? So, and I want to take it back to um, the Luanzia, uh, who, uh, like, I mean, just Zhuge Liang vibes all the way through. And yeah, I just love definitely. him. And the universe is knowable stuff kind of makes me think like it's a very low, low magic uh, series, right? And like you said, it could arguably be sci fi. Uh, Luan is, I guess, the closest thing to like a Gandalf figure, and all he really yeah. does is sit down and say, "Let's figure out how to do this," yes. and then and then they do it. And uh, yeah. I just like I love that character. I think he's brilliant, and uh, I love his his slogans and his little. Uh, I mean, not to get into spoilers, but his little the thing he carries with him yes. across the sea. Yeah, and uh, I just really love that character. I, I'm so glad you do because you know uh, one of the things, um, uh, Kyle and Hillary, that 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 really drove me to writing these books is my love of technology, of engineering. It's not, it's not so much science, but engineering. I mean, my my grandparents were scientists, and they were, um, you know, they were actual real bona fide big brain scientists i <laughs> i'm i'm unable to carry out that family tradition <laughs> but i went into engineering and i love engineering um the the very puzzle nature of it you know engineering is often thought of as boring but it's it's so far from that it's it's one of the most beautiful things you can do it's so it's so intricate and beautiful because as an engineer what you learn is to see the world um the way a poet does, um, you you learn a set of standard solutions to problems, and then you're given new problems. And what you have to do is take these standard components and put them together in novel ways to solve the new problem. And when you've done that well enough, your new assemblage becomes a component for the next generation of engineers to innovate on. And it's all about making things work. It's not about, you know, it's not just about math and, and 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 the fundamental discovery that science is concerned about concerned with, but engineering is very much about making concrete, practical changes and tinkering and and, and figuring things out in that way. Um, and the way I describe um, uh, the Dungeon Dynasty to people is sometimes to say that it's an epic fantasy in which the heroes are not wizards but engineers. That's basically it. The engineers play the role of wizards in something like Lord of the Rings. Um, the the like you say, you know, Luan is a Gandalf-like figure, the, the closest thing we do, and his wonder is, is saying, "Hey, look, you know, we can we can figure things out. The world is knowable. We just need to understand how these things work and come up with a solution. Uh, we we can figure it out." Um, I, I I really like that. Oh, I I'll just talk off. <laughs> I was uh, going to say, no look, wonder I like it so much. I'm engineer trained. And so maybe I you saw know. that in your um, your stories. That's why I love Luan as well. And uh, I love it. And I can say now, look, engineering is a type of magic. Yes, <laughs> Ken yes. told me so in the Dandelion <laughs> Dynasty. <laughs> I've always believed that. Um, and, you know, like I go into, uh, I, I think this is one of the, one aspect of the book that sometimes drives, um, um, drive some readers really nuts, which is the 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 amount of energy I devote to welcome back, Kyle. Um so one one of the things that um that I think some readers really uh kind of are taken aback by is the amount of energy I devote to explaining the technical underpinnings of these fantasy machines. I mean some reader might be like what is the point of this? This is all fantasy, you know? Why are you wasting your energy describing how it works? It's sort of like the thing they tell you not to do in writing workshops. They're like, you know, don't explain. Do not explain your magic. Magic. It's it's it's, it's nobody wants to read that. But I I I've always believed that you got to do the thing that makes you excited. You got to do the thing that you think is interesting. And it's interesting to me. I enjoy talking about um, automation and cybernetic concepts in fantasy i enjoy talking about you know what if benjamin franklin's ideas about static electricity and electrostatic machines actually worked out and what if you have a world in which the benjamin franklin motor is the foundation of engineering so i, I don't know if, uh, if if you recognize it but essentially the sigmatic motor is a version of ben franklin's original um 
electrostatic motor, which I've built uh, many prototypes of to make sure they work. Um, but uh, but it's, it's, it's just fun for me to work out that alternate uh, technology tree and, and figure out how things would function. Um, it's just, you know, I, I derive a lot of joy into explaining how these things work because like I said, it feels to me like a species of poetry. It feels, I, I want to give readers the same excitement I feel when I'm coming up with solutions to problems. I want readers to experience that joy of discovery, of figuring things out, of, of tinkering, of saying, I know how to do this and I can make it work. Um, you know, it's just in a very practical sense, uh, one of my hobbies is uh, restoring and repairing old retro consoles. So you can probably see a bunch of those on the wall. I was noticing over there. Your, yeah. your collection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I enjoy taking these old consoles and taking them apart and trying to figure out why they're not working anymore and trying to make them work again. And after you've you know, worked with so many of these consoles, you really just fall in love with um, the designers and, and the philosophy behind them. You can see from the first Game Boy to the Switch, how the design language has evolved and yet there's a sense of continuity. You can see how, you know, decades of innovation can be seen with each generation um, and, and, and how you can just follow those lines and, 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 and see, you know, they added a capacitor here to smooth out the noise. They added this little resistor here to make this light go on. They did that to do this. They, they made this to, to make the buttons react a certain way. It's so fun to see the problems they were trying to solve and how they solved it and to see how the evolution worked over the years. Um, that sense of joy of making something fit, of, of creating something new out of the old, that just feels so perfect. I wanted readers to experience that as, as they read it, um, to, to get a sense of it. Yeah. And I think we definitely do because that was yeah. at least, yeah, it was very, uh, I liked it. I mean, I'm biased again. I, <laughs> yeah. I that. loved it. And then like, <laughs> I'm, I'm the worst at figuring out, like, I'm never sure if it's an actual machine or if it's like, you're just making something up for the story. And I'm, just about, <laughs> I'm just like, okay, okay. What is it? Cause like I, I read the poppy war and she would like describe like modern technology as it was like hitting the story but in like a different, like in like a, somebody who'd never seen it before. And I would just read like half the book. I'm like, oh, she's talking about like, you know, like I would just not know. And so when I came to like Wall of Storms, I was like, okay, okay, is this a real thing? I was like really trying to, so like, yeah, I really appreciated the technology aspect. Yeah, um, it, it's so much fun. <clears throat> we are um, almost out of time. You've given us an hour of your time. There is a question that Kyle and I have to make sure we ask which is about cooking shows because in <laughs> um, yes. the veiled throne there is a um big portion that's about a cooking show i love cooking shows and i just felt like ken must watch cooking shows because yes. it is so dead on so i need to know which ones do you watch which are your favorites so it turns out that uh my family as a whole, we are huge fans of MasterChef Junior. Um, I knew which... it had to be MasterChef. <laughs> I, I think that's the one you Chef mentioned. Fan too. Yeah. Yes, I said, it's got to be MasterChef because <laughs> that's what it feels like. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I, without spoiling anything, um, there is a, a non-traditional epic battle in the Veiled Throne. Uh, that's that's basically what this discussion is about. Um, every epic fantasy must have some immense battle, uh, and uh, it just happens that I have two. I had two of them in the book that I wrote, and so when they chopped it in half, one of the battles ended up in the first book, and and that's how you ended up with what you have. Um, although. I will say uh, one more thing, which is, um, you probably have noticed this, but all the books in the series are written essentially with two halves. So The Wall of Storms shows this pattern. Um, mm -hmm. The first half is about internal politics, and then there's a sudden shift in the second half into being about this foreign invasion. So the book that I and I actually wrote, which was supposed to be the third book, the 700,000 word book, is structured the same way with the first half doing one thing and the second half doing a different thing. So when we chopped it down the middle, you just, what would otherwise be the two halves of the one book ended up as two separate books. So when you get 
the last book, just put them back together and you can see the same structure replicated. That there's, there's a sudden shift. Um, it's just that the turn in the book is where the third book ends. So <laughs> that's, yeah, that's and, where we, and we are. And we sense that for sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, MasterChef Junior, that's a great choice. Uh, it's much happier than the original MasterChef. So we also yes. enjoyed Junior a lot. Yes. <laughs> a little I don't less watch intense. cooking shows. So this is okay. all going over my head. <laughs> um, yeah, it was just the um, the showmanship and the way the judges talked to people. That was very <laughs> like reminiscent of yes. um, that. I, I was guessing it was either MasterChef or the Great British Bake Off were the two that Which I was... I also love. Yes. Okay. Which I also love. <laughs> Yeah. Um, because I definitely felt that energy, so that's fun. Fun to know. <laughs> yeah, you are. You are very much correct. <laughs> okay, Hillary got to nerd out about her thing, okay. so I want to nerd out about my thing, which is that you translate a bunch of uh, you know Chinese fiction uh, short stories, and I, yep. I saw in the Fonda Lee uh, interview or conversation that you did recently that you're now working on um, the uh, the Tao Te Ching, right? Is that what it was? That's right. Right. That's right. Um, so now that you've transitioned to nonfiction, I implore you, just put it in the back of your mind, <laughs> translate a new version of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. It's a big problem. It's a big project, but it needs a new yeah, translation. It, it, I think it, you could do it. It's one of those things where, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Take another 10 years. We did, we did the first 10 on the Dandelion. Yeah, that, that might be not just 10 years. That might be like... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the end project. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, thank you so much, Ken, for coming and talking to us about um, the Dandelion Dynasty and your stories and um, yeah, giving us some insight into your process. Thank we you really so much. It. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I always I enjoy talking about this stuff. So thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. Um, I've been like holding myself back this whole time to like let you, go, you, you just talk, but like, I've been like gushing this whole time. Um, I consider you one of my favorite authors, and just Thank like you. I don't, I don't take quotes out of books that often. And I highlighted fifty-one quotes in Wall of Storms on my Kindle. It like essentially it was just the whole book. And I just like I just think you're a brilliant writer. And thank you so much for talking. I to really us. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, Kyle and I talked about that a lot. I also don't take a lot of quotes, but Way the Fish was the one that really goes That's through my head. Yeah. Um, yeah. Often, okay, have I weighed the fish? That one really uh, hit me, and so. Um, yeah, we appreciate that you tell tell your stories and you make me cry a lot, which is very rare. So, you know, good for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I cry uh, easily, yeah, but it, it, it's still it's still a good a good sign. Also, I, actually, I will say sorry, but not sorry. But <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I told I told Kyle I was gonna say, you know, justice for Timu. Um I'm just very upset by no my, spoilers. By, no spoilers. I know. I just I'm imploring you to go rewrite anything if it's just gonna make me devastated for his storyline. <laughs> Please. I told Kyle I can't take it. I can't take it anymore. But anyway, thank you. Yes, we love your stories and we appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can't wait for speaking bones. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Which is We're coming out June twenty first, everybody. Yes. Pre-order right. now. Well, and you have right. time to start start Grace of Kings, and then you can read it how it's supposed to be read. Straight, straight through. That's right, straight story. through. The way it's meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> the way it's meant to be. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.